Fantasy football fans, do you want to win a signed Justin Jefferson jersey? My friends at Fantrax and I are partnering together to give away this awesome piece of signed memorabilia, and it's incredibly easy to enter the giveaway. Go over to Fantrax.com playbook and create your free account. Then go to the ffplaybook.com slash Fantrax giveaway and fill out the short form. That's it. Again, that's Fantrax.com slash playbook to create your free account. And then go to the ffplaybook.com slash Fantrax giveaway to complete the short form for a chance to win a signed Justin Jefferson jersey, courtesy of Fantrax. Now on to the podcast. What's going on, everyone? This is the Fantasy Playbook Podcast. My name is Kyle Yates, and I'm your host. I can be found on Twitter at KyleYNFL. I am joined today by a good friend, Trevor Sykema. He can be found on Twitter at Tampa Bay Trey. He is the host of the NFL Stock Exchange and all things over at PFF. Trev, how are we doing today? Kyle, I am doing great, my man. We are so close to night one of the NFL draft, man. I'm so excited for it. I love going on shows like this one. Don't get me wrong. But at this point, I'm just excited to see where these guys end up because it's going to be so fascinating to see all the fits. So I'm excited to talk about it here with you, but even more excited for draft weekend coming up. Man, I joined into the draft conversation in what, January? Like, you know, that's when I got into a draft season. You've been in draft season since uh, what? It never really stopped. It never since you know, I was like, born, was there... <laughs> Kyle. Since I was born, no, it I... it is it is funny. You mention it, like you, you know, you're doing your thing for fantasy football during the season. I'm covering college football and the NFL for PFF. But at the same time, me and you are draft heads, so we've always got a little bit of an eye towards the draft, and that's just kind of been my thing year round. But yeah, I've been I've been even doing mock drafts and player rankings and things like that since September, October, November, kind of for some of these positions. So it's been fun, man. It's been a long process. A long process for sure. I'm like in January is when I came to the table and I'm like, okay, let's get these landing spots, man. Like, let's please stop talking about who we have at wide receiver. <laughs> like all these, all these differences, like, okay, let's just find out where these guys are going. I cannot even imagine what it's like for you, but we are now, yes, less than 10 days away from the NFL draft. We've got to get through these final evaluations and teeing everything up for fantasy managers to get ready for the NFL draft and their dynasty rookie drafts. Before we get into the running back conversation here today, continuing that off of part one with Ray Garvin, going to continue the running back conversation here. Before we do that, NFL draft, we just talked about it less than 10 days away. We will be live on the Fantasy Playbook YouTube channel for night one, breaking down Garrett Price of Dynasty Nerds is going to join me, breaking down all of the picks here and the instant fantasy reaction, instant fantasy analysis, giving you everything that you need to know in the moment. We're going to have some, some amazing guests, guys. This guest list is absolutely phenomenal. You are going to want to check it out and some awesome, awesome giveaways courtesy of Pristine Auction. NFL Draft live stream, night one, April 28th, 7.45 p.m. through 1 a.m. I don't know. Who, who knows how long the NFL Draft round one is going to go. We will be live for the entire thing. Make sure that you sign up and make sure you're there at youtube.com slash the fantasy playbook. Also, a big way to help out the show is by rating and reviewing. Trev, you are on the other side of the podcast host and you know exactly how crucial rating and reviewing is for podcasts. So if you are enjoying the podcast here, a big way that you can help out is by rating and reviewing either on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen. Less than 30 seconds out of your day helps out in a massive, massive way. All right, Trev, let's get into the running back conversation here. Now, we talked about a few superlatives earlier on this week with Ray. We're going to continue that going here, and we're going to kick off the conversation with you with the best speed in the class. Who, in your opinion, I'm just going to turn this over to you right away. Who, in your opinion, is the fastest running back in this class, has the best breakaway speed? Who do we want to crown as the fastest player in the NFL draft coming up here? Well, while we were talking there, just got to let you know that I smashed five stars on the on the review oh, while you go. were saying that. So, uh, so look, everybody, it doesn't take too long. I just did it in that time. Do it when you're listening to the podcast. So, okay, best speed in the class. This running back class, I'll just start by saying it feels like a culmination of exactly where the NFL is going. And that is less of these guys that you're trying to fit in a three down back like role or specific style and it's a lot more about specialization and because of that there's a couple of different options that you could have for guys who have really nice home run speed in this class if you will but the guy that I keep going back to the guy who has production to go along with the speed is pierre strong jr from south dakota state university so for the jack rabbits this dude had three 1000 yard seasons almost had four i think he would have had four if it wasn't for the covid shortened season so he almost had four straight 1000 yard seasons and the reason is because okay sdsu doesn't exactly play the best opponents. Pierre Strong looked like a future NFL player. 
at least athletically, going up against these guys. And so, look, you know, it, whether it was a zone run or something behind a power with a puller or whatever it is, if he found open space past the line of scrimmage, getting to the second level, this dude was often making the most of it, getting first downs, hitting massive home run plays too. There have been 40, 50, 60 yard touchdowns that this guy has had throughout his career that I was able to watch on his tape. And so he just uses his speed really well. Sometimes guys are fast. Like sometimes we'll, we'll go to the combine. We'll go to Indianapolis, right, Kyle. And it'll be like, Oh, this guy, uh, he ran low four fours or high four threes. And you go, man, I didn't, where is, it? I didn't see that on the tape. Some guys don't have the rest of their game, specifically a knack for seeing space to the point where they can even use that long speed. I think Pierre Strong does. And so when I say who has the best speed in this class, it's a little more than just athletic ability, although Strong does have that. He was tied for the fastest 40-yard dash at the Combine. Mm -hmm. I think he also is able to utilize it very well. So I would say that he is the, uh, the best speed in this class. I think there's been a lot of comparisons so far already to Pierre Strong and Elijah Mitchell from last year where we look at Elijah Mitchell and say, okay, he was plugged into the perfect situation as that outside zone scheme. He's able to take advantage of that increased 40 yard dash time that he had dropped weight coming out of college. Uh, and then we saw that, right. He was able to just be dropped into that, into that scheme and he produced right away. My, my question with Pierre strong and his projection for the next level is, is he kind of in that same vein of Elijah Mitchell where it's like, I think he has to fall into that outside zone scheme for him to be truly effective. Do you agree with that? Do you think that he's one of the guys that can be plugged into any scheme and he's going to produce, or is it really, he's got to end up in that outside zone scheme where he's able to plant that outside foot, get up field, and then he can take advantage of that four, three, eight time. Yeah. There's only a handful of teams that really main like a wide zone rushing attack, right? San Francisco is one of them. You know, the New York jets are one of them. Uh, Green Bay does a lot of that stuff too. And so like, there's, there's not a lot of pure wide zone teams in the NFL, but a lot of teams still sprinkle in inside zone along with, even if they do a lot of uh, gap scheme, power scheme work as well along their offensive line. So I think the, the answer to your question in a simple way is yes, you, you would like for him to go to a unique situation or a specific situation, I should say, where he's able to be more of a one cut back than a guy who's got to have patience, stop, read between the tackles, get through the clutter of the linebackers. No, no, no. You would want this guy more towards the numbers, towards the hashes, the line of scrimmage, whatever it is, to be able to potentially put his foot in the ground, be a one cut back, cut up field, and then really hit the Jets and going. So I think he he's good enough at reading the field. He's got good enough patience. He's got good vision to where he could thrive in an offense that's not like exclusively wide zone, sure. but certainly one of those would be his best spot to get the most out of him. Yeah. I talked about this in part one. If you had asked me prior to the NFL combine, which running back was going to be the guy to run the fastest in the 40 yard dash at the running back position, I would have said Jerome Ford, the running back out of Cincinnati. I would have said based on his tape, based on the play speed, uh, consistently breaking away at the second level, Jerome Ford would have been my answer. And we saw Kenneth Walker emerge. We saw Pierre Strong. I mean, even Brees Hall with the 439. Like we saw these other guys run faster than Jerome Ford, but at his size, a 446 is certainly still flying. I still feel that. I still feel that weighing more of what we saw here at the uh, based on tape versus what we saw in the 40 yard dash, where going into that into the combine, if you would have said like we are going to have multiple players run under four four or in you know the low four fours, I would have been like you're crazy. Like this running back class did not profile as a freaky athletic class for me based on their tape. Jerome Ford was the standout. Pierre Strong certainly falls into that category, uh, but Jerome Ford is the guy that I'm going to say here for that best speed. I still feel very confident that he has the best play speed in this class. Someone that once you give him a little bit of space, he's going to break away and he's going to break away big at the next level. Jerome Ford. Any thoughts there on Jerome Ford before we move on to the next superlative? Well, I was just going to say, I uh, I picked him. My, my co-host over at NFL Stock Exchange, me and Connor had a had a little draft, if you will, before the combine, drafting who we thought was going to be the best at each position. And for running backs, you know, we did 40 vertical, broad jump, uh, and three cone, I believe, were the three categories. And you had to draft one running back for each, and then you couldn't repeat. I picked your own four for the 40. I, th I thought he yeah. was going to be a blazer. So I was right there with you. I was very shocked to see that he ran much slower than I thought he was going to. But I think the tape shows you plenty of explosiveness. He's Clearly much more natural when he's got the helmet and pads on. So definitely not worried about his speed. He's got some really nice all-around game as well. So I do like Jerome Ford. 
Fantasy football should be played the way that you want to. There are too many platforms out there that force you to play fantasy football the same way it was in 2010, but Fantrax allows you complete customization to set up your league the way that you want. Whether you want to have the ability to trade fab, or add bonus points for a player making a big play, or even as something as awesome and complex as the league being able to have players on multiple different teams, Fantrax is where you need to go. If you're looking for the most customizable and easy to use platform out there for any fantasy sport, sign up for free today at Fantrax.com playbook and be entered to win a signed Justin Jefferson jersey. Create your account and then head over to the FFPlaybook.com slash Fantrax giveaway for all the details. Again, to win a signed Justin Jefferson jersey, head over to the FFPlaybook.com slash Fantrax giveaway for all the details on how to enter. Fantrax, the home of fantasy sports. And it's crazy too. We're saying like he ran slower than we expected, and he still ran a four four six. Like four yeah, four, right, I right, right. like I that's still flying, you know. Like, and I think that that does show up. There's a difference too between what we see with just the guys running in the uh, what the underwear Olympics in the forty yard dash at the combine versus when the shoulders and you know, the pads and the helmet are on as well. So let's keep going here. Let's go to best contact balance here. Who in this class? really profiles for you as having the best contact balance. I think there's a lot of candidates that we could talk about here, but in your opinion, the the ability to break tackles consistently, elusiveness, however you want to categorize this, who is at the top of the class for you? I think it could have gone with Kenneth Walker here, but I think that he, you know, when I, with the spirit of the question, okay, contact balance, sometimes Kenneth Walker is just straight up making guys miss. Like, so right. I think that a little bit of elusiveness goes into that. So the guy that I think is, is more pure contact balance with how he gets yards after contact and gets those uh, yards after the line of scrimmage is Tyler Algier. I am a big mm. Tyler Algier fan, man. I really like him. I understand that he's got some flexibility concerns. He's not the most agile guy in the world. He's not going to be able to turn on a dime for you. But when this guy gets ahead of steam going, you can check out the highlight packages, some of his best runs that he's past, had this past season. He is bouncing off guys. The legs are like tree trunks. He loves to lower the shoulder. I just I feel like he has so many times throughout his tape used that strength contact balance to his advantage to gain so many yards after contact. And he had one of the most in, in, in all of the FBS this past season. Um, I think he was top 10, I believe off the top of my head in yards after contact. And so the way that he did that was by taking hits, bouncing off it, staying on his feet, keeping going. And I think that that strength profile pairs with what he is athletically, which is a really good linear athlete. I think he's got pretty decent long speed too. Now he's not a, I wouldn't call him a burner by any ways, right. but he is a strength profile guy who, if you get going in a straight line, if you get this guy, and again, a zone blocking scheme where he can read the line of scrimmage, put his foot in the ground, be a one cut back, start accelerating up field. That's a head of steam that a lot of defensive backs towards the, towards the sideline are not going to want to deal with. And I think you saw that during his time at BYU over the last couple of years, how he was able to rack up so many yards. And so I would say that my vote is Tyler Algier. There are a lot to choose from, but I'm gonna go with Algier for this one. Algier, the running back out of BYU, is someone that I really just kind of see falling. And, and I want to talk about this, too. I've said this where you have the top tier of Kenneth Walker, Brees Hall, depending on your order. You know, mm -hmm. I think that the unanimous cons you know, consensus is that these guys are in the top tier. And then after that, I feel like it's just one ma major cluster. And I think that Algier kind of falls into that camp for me. I was not as impressed with Algier's film as you were. But one of the main scouting notes that I took away was like, get this guy coming downhill what 225 yes, totally. pounds like get this guy coming downhill his ability to lower his shoulder he's the guy that you want on your roster to be able to turn to in those short yardage situations whether at the goal line whether you need to pick up that third and two right you need to be able to just lower the shoulder be able to drive through Algier was that guy for me that profiled as that and I think that you're right that ability to absorb contact keep his legs underneath him still and keep turning in that sense of the word of contact balance Algier definitely has one of the highest grades. I think you could have gone with Brees Hall here as well. Someone who is able to absorb contact really well. Zamir White is another guy that is able to lower his shoulder and just continue. Zamir, Zamir is just huge. He's <laughs> just huge. So There's like, just not just, a lot of people that can bring him down. <laughs> seriously. So you're able to get that low pad level, just continue and keep his legs underneath him. I'm going to go with a different angle here. I'm going to go with that elusiveness, that contact balance. Like you said, Kenneth Walker is able to make people miss in a phone booth, but he also has the ability to... Uh, fight off arm tackles to be able to continue totally. to just drive through Kenneth uh, according to PFF draft on Twitter Kenneth Walker forced more missed tackles this season than any other running back with 89 forced missed tackles this season yep. so Kenneth Walker is one of the guys that 
you, depending on how you categorize this, the ability to be able to drive through and pick up those tough yardage, tough yards, or the ability to fight through arm tackles in the open field, depending on which way you look at it. We give you two examples here, Tyler Algier, Kenneth Walker. I'm really Kenneth Walker's RB one for me. I absolutely love Kenneth Walker and his tape. Let's keep going here. Let's go with the best pass catcher. We are seeing more and more. You talked about that specialization in today's NFL. You've got the players who can fill that first and second down role. Then you need the players in your backfield who are able to catch the ball out of the backfield. Who in this class profiles as the best pass catcher for you? Okay, I'm cheating a little bit here. Or I, you know what? I'm going to say that I'm being more detailed here. That's actually how I'm going to set this up. Because pass catcher could have two different components in it that could mean a lot more depending on your talk, who you're talking to. Best hands in the class? I think it's Kyron Williams. Best routes in the class? I think it's James Cook. So those are the two guys that I would pick for this category of who the best pass catcher is. I think that Kyron Williams' entire build his entire brand as a running back is built around being a third down back whether it's pass protection or what he is able to do in the receiving game i feel like he was so reliable he was so smart he's got such a great football iq when it comes to making the smart decision on the money downs and i feel as though he's got really great hands he was re reliable in that regard for notre dame but on the flip side james cook i also want to give a shout out to him too because where kyron williams i think is a little bit limited as an athlete again a little bit more stiff not as flexible you know i see the same kind of issues with tyler algier as you, maybe you would for a more elusive scat back that's not the issue with james cook james cook's got that athleticism to him it's funny because his running style is so much like his older brother dalvin cook he's just about 15 pounds less right, right. <laughs> it, it just and that means 15 pounds less of break taking breaking tackle ability strength explosiveness all of that but he, what he is at a lighter weight is he's quicker and I think there are just so many times when you look at George's backfield, you mentioned Zamir White. I mean, there's been so many running backs throughout that program over the last couple of years. James Cook's never been the guy, but I think he's gotten better every single year. He's gotten a little bit more usage every year. And I think we saw this past season for their national championship run, how much he was utilized as a pass catcher in an offense that, shoot, let's face it, when they turned to the pass, it wasn't like he was prolific under Stetson mm -hmm. Bennett. They needed that underneath guy who they could dump the ball off to and made they, they could make magic happen. So whether it was him coming out of the backfield with his routes or even sometimes you know, motioned out to the line of scrimmage as a slot defender or even a, an outside receiver at the, line, at, the, uh, at the sideline, I feel like James Cook has such a great understanding of routes already. So best hands, I would say Kyron Williams, but best overall routes, I would say that it's James Cook. The two names that I wrote down for this category, Kyron Williams and James Cook as well. So let's spend a little bit of time here on James Cook and how he projects to the next level. Because based on my tape evaluation, I came away with like, this guy's really not going to bring you a ton on the ground. Get him in space, let him create, use that athleticism out in the open field. Yes, I absolutely think that. But I don't think that he's going to be someone that you're getting, you know, eight carries per game to plus the four to five targets per game. So that's at least my opinion, my takeaway. Did you see the same thing as far as his projection, his role to the, at the next level? Is he going to purely be that J.D. McKissick, Naheem Hines, you know, that type of role where you're really only utilizing him as a pass catcher, but he can still be a damn good one? The, the answer is probably yes, although I will say that Georgia's offense is power blocking up front. It is man gap pullers duo. Like it's between the tackles. It is a power run scheme at Georgia. Their offensive linemen are big, heavy, strong. Yeah. That's just the brand that they play with. That's not really James Cook's thing. Like if James Cook is going to be good as a ball carrier out of the backfield. It would be in kind of what we were talking about, more of a inside zone, wide zone rushing scheme where he, the, the offensive line is able to get moving. He's able to get moving. He's able to read the line, find the space, put his foot in the ground and get up field. So I, I, where I do think that his best role and what he's going to give back to a team is going to be as a third down specialist. One of those J.D. McKissick, you mentioned it kind of roles. Naheem Hines is just pass catching guys. But if he goes to a team that runs a decent amount of zone blocking with their offensive line, maybe could be a little bit more. Maybe he could have an RB2 ceiling instead of like this RB3 ceiling. Sure. So uh, I think that that's, that's the way that I'm looking at things with James Cook. It's a really good point, Trev. Let's talk about Kyron Williams. And 
break my heart at the NFL Combine. I absolutely Rough, love, we've talked about this. I absolutely love Kyron Williams going into the NFL Combine. I know that your co-host, Connor Rogers, friend of the show, also absolutely loved Kyron Williams, had him, I think, as a top two back. I think you loved Williams, but you had him a little bit lower as far mm -hmm. as your rankings going into the NFL Combine. And then he shows up to the Combine under 200 pounds, runs up what uh, nearly as slow as Jordan Davis. Uh, you know, like there was so many concerns here with Kyron Williams at the NFL combine. And now I just have absolutely no idea what to do with this guy going into the NFL draft. I still think that the tape is among the best in the class, the tape and what he brings you as far as a well-rounded running back. I think it's towards the top of the class, but how does the NFL value his athleticism or lack thereof? So what are you doing with Kyron Williams right now? Because I think we're going to move on to the best pass protection here, superlative as well. And I think that Kyron Williams is going to be our answer for both of this, right? Because yeah. Williams' pass protection is elite coming out of college. So let's talk about Williams. Let's spend some time here. What do we do with him now heading into the NFL draft? I mean, he's going to be a day three pick. I mean, there's, there's no, there's no doubt about it. You, you can't, you can't sit here and, and, justify him going as a as a certainly not a first rounder but even a, a second and third rounder given how he tested i mean when you look at just size as well height and weight 20th and 7th percentile wingspan second percentile arm length first percentile uh 40 yard dash 23rd percentile vertical jump 21st broad jump 33rd so like this dude is it's just not he's he's not an athlete and he's not big so when you are smaller you have to test better. And he absolutely did not do that. Now, when it comes to football IQ and instincts and kind of some of the things that I mentioned before, Kyron's probably one of the best in this class. I mean, when, when you and I were doing the podcast uh, over this past summer, we love Kyron Williams. We had Kyron Williams yep. like RB1 basically in this class. And it just, you get to the point where you go, okay, this is too much to overcome now. And I think that that really limits what he can be in the NFL and, and maybe less of ability. And it's more of the chance that he is going to get. I don't think a team right. is going to like fully invest in this guy, giving him early down work as well as third down work when he is not that athletic. I think they're always going to be, they're always going to be searching for more athletic backs to always bring in the fold with him. Now, again, when things are important, third down, Third and eight, you need a guy to pick up the block for you for your quarterback to make sure he's got enough time to get it past the sticks. You want Kyron Williams. It's third and two. You want to hit some guy on play action to really be able to manipulate a linebacker in space and get those two extra yards. Maybe he's not going to hit a home run for you, right? He's not going to turn that dump off into a 40, 50 yarder. Right, right. But but is he going to pick up those two yards? Yeah. The money down work is where Kyron Williams is going to make his money, if you will, as an NFL player because of how smart he is, how willing he is, that tenacity, everything, that mentality I love he brings to any third down situation, whether it's pass protection or um, pass catching out of the backfield. And yeah, we, I mean, we could just say I, Kyron Williams is my best pass blocker. There's no doubt about it. He has, so he is the embodiment of. It's not about the size of the dog. It's about the, the, the size of the dog in a fight. It's about the size of the fight and the dog. There we go. There you go. That is Kyron Williams and what he is able to bring. He'll take on defensive ends. He'll take on linebackers. He'll take on safeties. He'll take on Jordan Davis if somebody asks him. <laughs> so that's just kind of the mentality that you have for him. So I, so I think he's a third down specialist. That's that's really it. Going into the NFL Combine, it was like, okay, I think that there's enough. If Kyron Williams can crack that 200 barrier, if he can break that 200 pound barrier, then okay, he can profile as a guy that you can give 10 carries to per game. Plus, then you know, uh, elite reception ability. Uh, the you know the pass protection is there. He's going to get onto the field on third down. You can get five to six targets per game too. That's that'll work. That'll play for fantasy football absolutely. Then out of the NFL Combine, now it's like okay. He's not going to be someone that you are willing to give that many carries to per game, just based on the lack thereof of the athleticism. And then, but the profile is there for him to be that third down guy in a backfield landing spot is everything for Kyron Williams. If he ends up with a guy that, you know, the comparison of Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt in Cleveland, Nick Chubb, not a receiving back. He's a first and second down guy. You have Kareem Hunt in there as that third down guy. Then if Kyron Williams were inserted into that Kareem Hunt role, 
now there's relevance. There's the ability for him to be a guy that we can look at for fantasy football. We've seen, like, just because you're drafted on day three as a running back doesn't mean that you're irrelevant. Aaron Jones, I mean, like, Austin Eckler, undrafted, right? Like, the that doesn't mean that you are irrelevant, but it's going to be the landing spot and where he falls into is going to be everything as far as his projection at the next level. The other guy that I wanted to mention here as far as that best pass protection who I, I certainly not in the same tier as Kyron Williams, but Damian Pierce, the running back out of Florida. I wanted to bring him up here as a guy that we can talk about as having really, really solid, uh, you know, pass protection technique. We saw that at the senior bowl, someone that I did want to talk about here, Damian Pierce. I feel, do you agree with this? Like we've completely forgotten about Damian Pierce heading into the NFL draft. We have just stopped talking about this guy. Listen, you sent me the show sheet before we started, and the next category, if I believe I'm correct, is my guys. So mm -hmm. if that's the case, this is a good transition because Jamie and Pierce is there. We my go. Guy. Now I will tell people out there, I graduated from the University of Florida, so this one was pretty easy. But there is so much to love about Damian Pierce, and I have told people throughout this entire process. The more you learn about Damian Pierce, once you obviously watch the tape and understand what kind of a prospect he is, right? He's not Derrick Henry. He's not Christian McCaffrey. So I'm not talking about that. But the more you dig into who Damian Pierce is, his mentality towards the position, how much better he's gotten and how much more he has in the tank than what we saw at Florida the more you are going to love him. He is a guy who loves this game, loves playing running back. He is absolutely going to be a locker room favorite. He has got a personality that lights up a room no matter what room he is in. Every time he talks to the podium, people listen, whether it's because it's wisdom and leadership or, or he's charismatic. He is just he is somebody who I'm telling you is going to be in the NFL for as long as he wants to. Because I think that he has a baseline talent to be a pro at the, at the next level, but also because of what an incredible locker room presence that I think he is going to be. He is a great pass protector. In fact, on day two of the Senior Bowl, they ended practice. Well, they did this. This they did this every day. I should set this up differently. At the end of day, at the end of the day, every practice, they picked one pass rusher and they picked one pass protector, and they said, "Line up." go at each other. You stand in front of him as long as you can. You get by him as fast as you can. And I believe it was day one, Jermaine Johnson. I can't remember who he went up against. It might've been Darian Kennard. I think, I think it was remember. Darian Kennard. Oh, yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. But yep. Kennard got the better of him the very first rep. And then Jermaine Johnson absolutely whooped him on the next two reps to win best two out of three. The second day, they had... um DeMarco Jackson from Appalachian State, the linebacker, go up against Damian Pierce. Damian, this is one-on-one -on -one here. One-on-one -on -one in full space. Like, there's no help, no nothing, no angle, whatever. And Jackson just sprinted straight at Damian Pierce, and he stoned this dude. You heard the crack of those pads miles away. Damian Pierce got the hands exactly where he needed to, right up underneath the armpits, stayed with him. Jackson tried to rip him to the left. Pierce stayed in front of him. And then afterwards, Pierce, you know, throws off his helmet and everybody's going crazy around him and they kind of like dogpile him and everything. So, yes, he's a great pass protector. Uh, it was absolutely criminal how little Dan Mullen used Seriously. him this past season. I think that he's got decent enough speed to be a successful player that you could put on the field and that could make a 53-man roster week in and week out because of what he does for you on third down and short yardage situations as a power back that'll give you that kind of determination and never quit for short yardage, third downs, goal line, whatever it is. Love Damian Pierce. Jerome Ford was my guy. If you want a breakdown of why exactly, then you can go back to the previous episode here in this series with Ray Garvin. Talked about Jerome Ford there as my guy. Let's move on here to the favorite sleeper. Who later on in this class, Trev, that we are not talking enough about? You mentioned Pierre Strong. I think that he's someone who could certainly qualify here, but maybe someone even further down the board than that. Who are you thinking here as far as your favorite sleeper that really no one's talking about and they should? I like Keontae Ingram, the running back from USC, man. I think he's got a lot of really nice all-around game. He's not the fastest guy. He's not the biggest guy. He's not the strongest guy. He's not the most agile, but he does all those things really well. If you go back to his high school tape, man, he was a, a four-star recruit from the state of Texas. He had back-to-back 2,000-yard -back seasons as a high schooler. He had more than 30 touchdowns in each of them, so production was certainly his middle name as a recruit. He ended up going to Texas, committing to Texas, and he just – 
he just never looked comfortable there. I, I know that yep. he was fluctuating weight a little bit. He was up, he was down. And it's just like, he didn't, he just never looked comfortable. And I feel like at USC, he looked a lot more comfortable, but it was kind of a rotation there with him uh, in, in his short time that he was with the Trojans. And so he didn't necessarily have a ton of production when he was with the Trojans either, but I think the best days for him could be ahead in the NFL. I just feel like he does a lot of things really well. He's not elite at one thing, but I think he's got great all around game. And I feel as though now that he's kind of at that home, comfortable weight and confidence in his own game, I'm very curious to see where he ends up. If it's a running back room that he's got a chance to compete in right away and what he could do with that kind of a role. I know that Brett Coleman, a good friend of ours, absolutely loves Keontae Ingram. So that, uh, and Brett knows the stuff. So Keontae Ingram there as someone that we need to be talking about a little bit more. We're getting tight on time here, Trev. Let's run through your top five rankings before we end the show. All right. Uh, I have Kyron Williams at number five just because he is the drug that I cannot quit. <laughs> I think that his value on third down is just too good. He's just got too high of a football IQ for me to have him any lower than five. So I got him at five. I got Isaiah Spiller from Texas A&M at four. I think that Spiller's got good athleticism, but I think the eye for space and the patience are things, the two things that I just let left me wanting to see more from him. If he hmm. was a little bit more patient, I feel like if he could – see green grass before it opened up, if you will, a little bit better. He'd get a lot more out of that athleticism. So I, I think that there might be a spot for him in the NFL, but I'm just a little bit hesitant on him. So I got him as RB4. Number three, I got Tyler Algier. Again, love the mentality. Love what he is as a bulldozer. You get him going downhill, and I think he could be uh, an absolute rock for you. Former uh, linebacker as well, so he's got that mentality of what it's like yep. to be tackled as a running back as well as uh, go and break some tackles too. So I love that perspective that he has. I get Kenneth Walker at RB2, and I got Brees Hall at RB1, but honestly, man, you told me you got Kenneth Walker at RB1. I got no complaints there. These are two fantastic right. players. I think I think Kenneth Walker gives you more of a power profile than Brees Hall does. I'd love to see Brees Hall in a zone blocking scheme to get the most out of that patience, that elusiveness, and that speed that he can put on display once he gets into open space. Kenneth Walker, Michigan State played a lot of zone blocking, but I'd actually love to see what he could be between the tackles because if I had one real gripe, if you will, with Kenneth Walker – is that I think he bounced things out too often, too much. Sure. <laughs> and, sure. and you know what? He was more elusive and he was faster than a lot of the people that he was facing this past year. And so it worked out for him clearly as the dope Walker winner for college football's best running back. But the NFL, you're not going to be able to bounce it to the outside nearly as much as right. you think. I think that's a lesson that Derrick Henry had to learn as well when he was coming right. from Alabama. I think Kenneth Walker is going to have to learn that same exact lesson. Get him a scheme that's versatile, does some man blocking, does some zone blocking, and I think you get a really productive running back in there. Trevor Sigma, ladies and gentlemen, the host of the NFL Stock Exchange podcast and all things over at PFF. Trev, why don't you let the people know what you got going on here leading up into the NFL draft, maybe after, and one final question for you. Does George Pickens go in the first round? Oh, man. So everything I got going on over at PFF.com, uh, on Twitter, at Tampa Bay Trey, and then, of course, the NFL Stock Exchange podcast with Connor Rogers as well. We're doing pods all three three days a week, and then, of course, recapping every day of the draft. So make sure you guys check that out after you check out this podcast, of course. And then, no, as much as it kills me, I don't think that he makes it in the first round, but he should, Kyle. He, he absolutely should. should. I'm just not so sure that he does. I think he's going to be uh, one of the better receivers of this entire class maybe even the best when it's all said and done depending on where he lands again we talked about it at the beginning of the show look at this we're, we're planning transitions we're talking about the uh it's seamless transitions we talked about landing spots we want to find out these landing spots man tell me where george pickens is going to go i need to know here i need to know where george pickens is going to go we're going to find out here in just over a week all right that'll do it for trevor sycama i'm kyle yates and we'll see you next time